many students often go into the exam feeling unprepared, not sure what to expect and how to approach the questions given. So I thought it would be helpful to share some valuable tips and guidelines on how to answer exam questions. In part one of this exam prep series, I'm going to be focusing on answering data analysis questions. So these are the investigative questions with graphs, charts, and tables that are usually the most challenging on the exam paper. So if you need some help in this area, keep watching. Now here's a look at the exam format for the CSET Biology Paper 2. It's important to note that the first question on the paper is a data analysis question and this is worth 25 marks and it's going to test the ANI which is analysis and interpretation plus ORR which is observation, recording and reporting. Now for the HSB paper, the investigative question is also the first one on the paper. So in this case, the question is worth 15 marks. So you really have to be prepared to answer these type of investigative type questions for both subjects. So what is CSC really testing with these investigative questions? So they're really checking to see if you can analyze and interpret and use your knowledge that you would have gained throughout the course. So first of all, you should be able to record information in tables, graphs, diagrams, or charts. Now secondly, you should be able to identify trends, patterns, and relationships within the data given. So reading off information and understanding information from the tables or the graphs, and then you need to be able to evaluate that data and make conclusions or inferences. So what you have gathered from the information given. And you may also need to make calculations depending on the type of question given, depend, depend on type of um, topic. So for instance, with species density, so that is related to sampling methods in biology, um, you would need to know how to calculate species density. So there's certain formulas that you would use. So you should be able to make those relevant calculations if necessary. And you also need to be aware of the three different types of graphs that can come. You have the bar chart, the histogram, line graph, or line curve. And then in terms of the different types of tables, we have numerical tables, and then there's the non-numerical tables. So let's look at the bar charts. So bar charts are used to represent categories, which is like discontinuous information, discontinuous data, rather than continuous data. So bar charts are generally used to represent like population information, disease statistics, and you need to note that the bar charts do not, the bars do not touch within the bar chart. So as you can see here, the bars are separated and with the wildlife population bar chart, you see it's based on the years and then the numbers of the dolphins and the whales. And then with the other one based on race and ethnicity, it's based on the um, age, age categories that you're seeing there. So the actual bars are not going to be touching. So they're distinctly separated into categories. So think of it that way. Now let's look at the difference now, the histogram. So the histogram is used to represent frequency, distribution, or continuous data. So that is like with age, height ranges, and in this case, the bars are touching. So these two graphs shown here, these two histograms, you can actually see that all the bars are touching. So it usually displays the frequency, like how often a particular um, category. So in this case with the age, the age histogram, we want to know like how much people are within a certain age range. Similarly with the height, we want to know how many people have a particular height you know, between 160 to 169 centimeters, for example. So there are different ranges. So this is continuous data. So you have the bars touching. Now let's look at the line graphs. So the line graphs are used to represent continuous data over time. So such as plant growth, enzyme activity, transpiration rate. So typically with the line graph, you plot the, you plot the marks, the dots, and you would just draw in the line to connect those dots so like you're playing dot to dot pretty much so it's really there another way of representing continuous data similar to the histogram 
So sometimes they can actually be used interchangeably depending on the type of um, the topic, the area, the, the data that is being examined. So the key points about plotting graphs. So generally data should be plotted correctly. This is what the examiners will be looking for, that you can plot the information on the graph correctly. You need to be able to use an appropriate scale. So at least half of the graph paper should be used up on both axes. So you don't want some small little squashed up graph on a large grid lines available for you to use. So you want to make sure you have a nice scale that takes up the majority of the space available on the, the graph. Thirdly, you want to have both the vertical or the y axis and the horizontal x axis correctly labeled. So you want to make sure that the, the appropriate factors that you're investigating, they are properly labeled on the right axis. And then you also need to have an appropriate title. So graphs, tables, they all should have a title. So in terms of the line graphs, your curve should be smooth and not done with a ruler. But only straight lines can be used. Um, can you use a ruler if it's an actual straight line? And that usually doesn't happen too much in, in biology. But generally, the curve should be smooth and not done with a, a ruler. And for bar charts and histograms, the bars for each factor should be clearly distinguished or there should be a key given. So let me insert that. Um, so you can see here for this bar graph, we have the key showing the race or the ethnicity. So three different races shown and that is represented in the bar graph um, for the different ages. All right, so those are some guidelines on plotting graphs. Now let's move on to look at constructing tables. Okay, so similar to graphs, you need to have a title for the table. So in this table shown here, the title is table one showing the height of grass over a three week period. Now, in addition to appropriate title, the heading should include units, appropriate units. So for example, centimeters, grams, it might be milliliters, whatever the case may be. And the unit should not be included in the body of the table next to the listed values. That is a no-no. So once you place the units in the headings, that is the main thing. You do not have it next to each value listed in the table. And then the correct abbreviation should be used in the headings. So the abbreviation for centimeters, grams, etc. And then the decimal points of value should be consistent throughout the table. So in this table, you're seeing that it is two decimal places. So those are some key guidelines that you should consider when constructing your tables. So the last thing I want to show you is just some common topics that often involve graphs or tables or charts. So this is just a list of the topics that can um, come based on investigations and so forth. So for the rest of this video, I will insert some clips of some questions from past paper solutions that would involve graphs and tables and charts and that kind of thing. So you see exactly how, how I go about answering them. A group of students conducts an experiment to investigate the rate of reaction of enzyme X at different temperatures. The results of the experiment are shown in table one. So we have the temperature values here in this column, right up to 50 degrees Celsius, so from zero to 50 degrees Celsius. And then we have the values for the rate of reaction of enzyme X. So that is in milligrams of product per minute. So it's just showing you how fast enzyme X would react how fast it would convert substrate into product. So we're going to have to plot a graph. So that is what the first part of the question asks. Plot the data in table one on this grid below. So I have the graph plotted already. So you would have your, your rate of reaction on the y axis in milligrams per minute. So you can see the scale that I've used and it go up to 25 because the highest temperature, the highest rate of reaction, sorry, is actually 24. So we're going to go up to that scale in fives. And then on the x axis, we have the temperature values, the temperature scale. 
So we go from 0 degrees Celsius right up to 50 degrees Celsius. So it would have gone up in fives. So this is how your curve should look. So pretty much like a mountain. All right, so let's go to the next part of the question. So part two says use the graph plotted in A1 to identify the optimum temperature for enzyme X. So I have that the optimum temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. So let's look at the graph and see how we get that. So if you look at the graph, the optimum temperature is represented by the peak of the graph, the peak of the curve. So that's the top of the mountain. So you look and you see that at the top, so that is when the reaction rate is at its highest. So that is at 24 milligrams per minute. And then you will simply come down to see what temperature that is at. So that is 30 degrees Celsius. So that is when the reaction is the fastest. Okay, so part three now, account for the shape of the graph between five degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. So let's go back. So five degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. So that is within this range here. So five degrees Celsius, right up to 30 degrees Celsius, which was the optimum. So you can see that there is a general increase in the rate of reaction as the temperature is being increased right up to the optimum temperature. So you say as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases up until the optimum temperature. So that is pretty much what you call an, an exponential increase. So it's, it's gradually increasing as temperature increases. So the enzyme really requires heat. So this is just the explanation for why this would occur. The enzyme requires heat to pretty much provide the energy for the reactant. So these are the substrates that the enzyme is going to be reacting with. So they need to be energized and they collide more frequently with each other and also the enzyme so that the reaction can get going. So we need some level of energy so that as the temperature is increasing, that's why you have that increased rate of reaction up until the optimum temperature where the rate of reaction would be the highest. So now we have to account for the shape of the graph above 40 degrees Celsius. So let's look at the graph again. So beyond the point of 40 degrees Celsius, so we're looking at 40 degrees Celsius, what do you notice? You can see that there is a, a rapid decline in the rate of reaction right down to 50, 50 degrees Celsius. So beyond this temperature, this, 50, this 40 degrees Celsius, you realize that the heat is going to cause the enzyme to be denatured. So your knowledge of how, how enzymes behave, you know that too much heat can cause the enzyme to be denatured. So pretty much the shape of the enzyme becomes unraveled and it's pretty much destroyed and it cannot function as it should. So the rate of reaction will therefore slow down till it reaches zero when the reaction stops completely at the 50 degrees Celsius. All right, so part four, stay at one precaution that the student should take when carrying out this experiment. So you need to really be monitoring the temperature closely. Ensure that you're reading the temperature value on the thermometer properly and that the enzyme, the enzyme is kept at the right temperature for each stage of the experiment. So the enzyme, obviously in combination with the substrate that is going to be acting on that solution, you need to make sure that the temperatures are kept at the correct temperature for each stage of the experiment. So that is one precaution that you can consider. All right, let's look at part B. Part one, name two enzymes that break down protein. So the two enzymes are pepsin and trypsin. And you can also mention renin. Renin is a special protein enzyme for milk protein. It's very important in clotting, helping clot the milk protein. So the two main ones that you can mention are the pepsin and the trypsin. Part two, name two parts of the human alimentary canal where enzymes that break down protein are found. So this would be in the stomach and the small intestines. So that's where you would find the two enzymes that we just mentioned above. 
So part three, suggest two reasons why the different enzymes for breaking down proteins are located in two different parts of the alimentary canal. So the pepsin enzyme, you should be familiar with this enzyme and know that it is found in the stomach where it is acidic. So the enzyme functions best optimally at a low pH. So that is between one to two. So the optimum, the optimum pH for the pepsin enzyme is very, very low. So therefore within the stomach where you have the hydrochloric acid, so that gives it that acid environment. So the pepsin would work best under those conditions. Now on the other hand, the trypsin enzyme would be found in the small intestines, a totally different environment. So in here now, we have a neutral to alkaline pH. So the pH is roughly between seven to eight. So the trypsin enzyme works best under these these conditions, these neutral to alkaline conditions. Table one shows the number of children in hundreds who suffer from diet related diseases in country X and country Y. So we have this table here with diet related diseases, also known as deficiency diseases, where you are lacking specific nutrients in the diet. So we have marasma, squash urocor, scurvy, night blindness, and we have the number of children for each of the countries, country X and country Y. So part one on the grid provided on page seven, draw a bar graph to represent the data in table one. And this graph is worth three marks. All right, so I have the graph here constructed already. So key things you need to note when you are constructing your bar graph, you need to place the correct information on each axis. So on the Y axis, you're gonna have the number of children in hundreds. And then on the Y at the X axis, sorry, the deficiency disease. So marasma, squash urocor, scurvy, and night blindness. And then because we are dealing with two countries, we need to have a key. So we have the empty box representing the country X and the box with the line representing country Y. So you're pretty much going to construct the bars based on the numbers provided in the table. So as you can see here from Marasmus, there were 65 children, 65 children, which will be 6500, because remember these are in hundreds. So 65 for country X, 55 for country Y. And then you go about constructing your bar, your bar graph according to the numbers provided in the table. So we can see Kwashi Yorker has 70 for country X, 30 for country Y, scurvy, 35 for country X, 45 for country Y, and then finally for night blindness, we have 20 for country X and 25 for country Y. So that is how your bar graph should look. All right, so now moving on to part two, it asks which country has the higher incidence of both marasmus and quashi or core. So just going back to the table now, we look at the section on marasmus and we can compare country X has 65, country Y has 55. So obviously in the marasmus, we can see that country X has the highest amount. And then when we look at the quashi or core, country X has 70, country Y has 30. So overall, country X has the highest incident, the higher incidence of both marasmus and quashi or core because Country X has 65 for Marasmus, 70 for Kwashi Yorker, as compared to Country Y, which only has 55 and 30, which are much less. All right, so part three, which country has the lower incidence of diseases altogether? So we're looking at the country which would have the least number of individuals suffering from these diseases presented here in the table. So you're gonna have to total give a total for the for each of the countries and the total number of cases for country X came up to 190 so you're just adding up all that is available there for each of the diseases so country X has 190 while country Y has a total of 155 so therefore the lower incidence of diseases the country that has the lower incidence would be country Y which has only 155 
compared to 190, which is country X. So country Y is the country with the lower incidence. Table 1 shows data obtained from a tree study done by ecology students. So we have a table here with the lists of different organisms and the numbers for each organism. So you're asked to plot the data from Table 1 on the grid provided on page 5. So you're going to need to choose an appropriate graph. So here I have a bar chart. So we have the number of organisms on the y-axis and the actual names of each organism on the x-axis. So basically with a bar chart, you have the spaces between the bars, they're never touching. So bar charts are usually represent categorical data. So they're distinct categories. So we have the number of ants and the number of spiders, lizards. So it's not continuous data as if you were going to put a histogram. The histogram have the bars actually touching. So histogram is used for continuous data. So with this one, we are using the bar chart. So you will just put the, make sure you have a good scale, an appropriate scale to use for the y-axis here. So we're going up in tens. And according to the table, you just um, construct the actual bar based on the numbers. So we're seeing the different numbers for each of the organisms. So that is the bar chart there. Part B, name and outline two possible sampling methods that the students may have used to collect the data shown in table one. So uh, first, a good method would be the mark recapture method. So this is usually good for organisms that move around. So you can sample the population of the organisms such as the egrets, lizards, frogs. So what you do is that you visit the area. So that will be the first visit. You mark or tag the organisms. You count how many organisms you find. And you, you return the organisms back to their, their habitat, of course. And then you will return a second time to count the number of marked and unmarked organisms. So this gives you a better idea of the true population size. So mark and recapture method would be good because we have many moving organisms there. And then the pooters are useful for collecting small insects. So like the ants and also the arachnids, the spiders, depending on how big they are, they can also perhaps be collected through the pooters, but mostly very small insects like ants and ladybirds, that kind of thing. So you collect them from the leaves of the trees or the the um, bark of the trees. So it works through the sucking of the air from the tube that is attached to the jar so that so those insects will be sucked in and be collected in the jar or the holding container. So those are two possible sampling methods that could have been used. We're looking at a bar graph. The bar graph in figure one shows the incidence of asthma in a population in the Caribbean. So we're looking at this bar, bar graph or bar chart. So on the y-axis, we can see the number of asthma attacks per year. And then on the x-axis, they have the lean smokers, lean non-smokers, obese smokers, and obese non-smokers. So this is basically describing the the, the, the population, what kind of qualities, what kind of health condition there may be. So, part one says, based on the information in figure one, which two factors reduce the risk for asthma? So obviously if you're talking about reduce the risk for asthma, you should expect the bar, the bars on the bar chart to be the lower ones, meaning that fewer people will have the risk. So if I'm looking at this bar chart, the lower, the lowest bars are under, are by lean non-smokers and obese non-smokers. So therefore you can see the two factors would obviously be being a healthy weight, being lean or slim, and then not smoking. So those two factors reduce the risk for asthma. Part two, describe the trend illustrated in figure one. 
So you can see clearly that the incidence of asthma attacks per year increases with smoking and obesity. So these two factors increase the risk of asthma attacks. So you can see the highest number of asthma attacks occur in obese smokers. So that's just above 40 asthma attacks per year. And then the lowest number of asthma attacks occur in lean non-smokers. So that lowest number is about 5 asthma attacks per year. So that basically describes the trend. All right, so let's continue on. So look at this other graph now. This is a line graph you're seeing here. So it says every year tons of Sahara dust are transported over the Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean. Figure 2 shows the yearly deposition of Sahara dust in the Caribbean. So it wants you to examine the chart, the graph, and then answer these following questions. So part 1, which month has the lowest level of Sahara dust? So clearly from this line graph, so we have on the y-axis the amount of Sahara dust produced in tons and then on the x-axis we have the months of the year. So clearly you can see the lowest level of Sahara dust was produced in December because that's the lowest point on the graph. So D representing December and the highest level of Sahara dust in part 2, so that would be March. So you can see that's the peak of the graph there the highest point. Part 3 now says suggest two health implications of high levels of Sahara dust in the atmosphere. So this Sahara dust will be acting as a pollutant. So it will be like pollution in the atmosphere. So this would have a serious impact on the health of individuals and it would definitely increase respiratory illnesses such as asthma, and sinusitis, people who have allergies, and then you can also say that it can affect the visibility. If there's a lot of dust in the atmosphere, it can affect the clarity, the ability to see properly with the amount of levels of dust. And dust in the atmosphere can also lead to burning of the eyes as well. If you have any questions, feel free to comment them below and I'll be glad to answer them. If you found this video helpful, feel free to subscribe, like and share. And don't forget to hit that notification bell.